Okay, so to make up for the ultra-finitism or finitism, <laughs> then now we're going to go the exact opposite and, and try to see how far we can go into the infinity with the ordinals. Thanks. Yeah, I mean, this was not meant as a provocation or anything. <laughs> um, right, okay, so this is joint work with uh, Frederick Nordwell Forsberg and Chuan Chi Xu. And, um, okay, so, well, the first question, well, given this title, the first question is probably, what are ordinal numbers? And the lazy answer is, well, you start counting, and if you are done with all the natural numbers, 0, 1, 2, 3, and so on, you just add a number omega, which is the smallest uh, number, which is larger than all the finite ordinals numbers, and then you continue with omega plus one and so on. Um, but I mean, this doesn't really capture, or, or well, if you see like this answer, this doesn't tell you anything uh, about why one would want to do this. So here's my favorite explanation for people on the street for why one would want such numbers. Uh, so say we have Alice and Bob, and Alice works for a house building company, so she uh, helps building and selling houses. And Bob is a buyer, he wants to buy a house and he has reserved a house that Alice promised to build. So now of course the question which Bob probably has every day is, when is my house finally ready? And Alice maybe says, well, it, it will take some time, but at most 20 more days. So the next day Bob asks again, how long does it take now? And then Alice says 19 days. So um, well, the rule for Alice is she has to say a lower number. I mean, Bob would be okay if Alice said 10 days. It would be a pleasant surprise, which never happens in practice. <laughs> but, but like if Alice said, well, it still takes 20 days, then Bob would say there's something wrong. Um, so well, if, if Bob is now persistent enough, then at some point uh, his house will be completed. But now let's see, um, the conversation could instead go like this. So Bob asks, when is my house ready? And Alice says, omega plus one days. And now this um, looks more discouraging than it really is. So it, it does not mean that it takes infinity long um, because the next day Alice has to give an answer again and now well, she can say omega days uh, because that's lower than omega plus one. But now if Bob asks again the next day, then Alice actually has to tell him a finite number. Uh, so ome saying omega doesn't actually mean that it takes infinity long. It just means that, well, I will tell you tomorrow how long it takes. And in the same way, omega plus one tells, uh, says, um, well, I, I don't know yet, but I will tell you in two days how long it takes. Um, <laughs> right. Okay, so I mean, like this is my favorite explanation for the person on the street, what the, dif what the difference between omega and omega plus one is. Right, okay. Um, the other standard uh, application of ordinals is this uh, Hydra game, where say you are fighting against a Hydra, which maybe might look like this. Um, and uh, so in each step, you choose a head that you chop off. So you can only chop off one head at a time. So you cannot like chop off uh, a whole branch of heads, but you have to take a topmost head. And so for example, this one, and you chop it off, but the hydra is nasty. And whenever you chop off such a head, the hydra grows back a number of heads uh, and it, it grows back the whole branch that you have attacked uh, twice. So it looks like the Hydra is growing scarier and scarier. And it's not intuitively obvious that you have actually made any progress at all because it looks like the new monster that you have in front of you is now worse than the one that you have uh, faced initially. But you can now see that uh, each such Hydra um, presents an ordinal. Um, can I use a pointer here? Right, yeah. So you can say that this hydra here represents the ordinal omega cube plus one, like this branch here represents omega cube because there are 
three hats, and this one is just a single one. Um, and, and here, one such branch is omega square, because there are two hats on the outside, and you have three of them, but omega square times three is, is much better than omega cube. So in, in this sense, this hydra here has actually uh, become significantly smaller than the initial one, which means that if you continue chopping, up hat, uh, uh, chopping off hats, then eventually you will um, kill the hydra in the sense of uh, chopping off the hydra's last hat. Okay, all right. So now let's um, be a bit more serious and let's uh, talk about how one could implement such a type of ordinal numbers in constructive type theory. So one um, standard implementation is this type of Brouwer trees, uh, which is a good example of an inductive type because it's just a, um, an, an obvious um, extension of the natural numbers where you have a constructor zero and a constructor successor, and then this constructor that we call limit, which takes uh, sequ an, a sequence of, of such ordinals indexed over natural numbers and constructs a new ordinal. And then you can say that omega is the limit of the sequence 0, 1, 2, 3, and so on. And you can define all the usual arithmetic operations. Well, at least addition, multiplication, exponentiation. Um, and, and yeah, uh, so now if you look at this again, then you will maybe think this is a little bit unsatisfactory because, for example, one problem is that the limit operator does not really construct limits. So if you take the sequence 0, 1, 2, 3, and so on, this does not give you the same limit as the sequence 1, 2, 3, 4, and so on, even though, I mean, of course, these sequences have the same limit, but um, these expressions are just syntactically different. And that is a problem for what I want to talk about next. So, well, I mean, we, we spent quite some time on, on trying to fix this without destroying other properties that we also want. And uh, in the end, what uh, Fred's and Chuanchi's and my approach was, was to use an, use an inductive inductive construction with pass constructors. And um, our compromise is that this limit constructor here can only take strictly increasing sequences. But as, well, here I show you the, the definition in cubical acta, um, but the, the details don't matter. So really the only important thing is, as I said, uh, this, const this limit constructor only takes strictly increasing sequences and then there are a bunch of other constructors which ensure that essentially this type behaves like you would want it to behave. Or in other words, uh, I mean, only the blue box here is, is important. So everything that you would reasonably hope for works, at least if you, are, um, if you have the same expectation that I have, I guess. Or I mean, like, like maybe the better way to phrase this is to say, if you... <laughs> have a property and you ask me whether this property holds, then it either holds or there's a very good reason why it does not hold. And, and there's a very good reason why um, no implementation of Brouwer tree ordinals um, with, with the, the properties that we want would, would have this property. Okay, so let's um, maybe talk about decidability. So the decidability that I use is standard. If P is some type or statement or proposition or anything, then we say that P is decidable if we have an element of P plus not P. So here this uh, U plus is a normal coproduct in the usual sense of, of Martin Left type theory. Uh, so this is of course the same synthetic notion of decidability that Dominic talked before lunch. Uh, this is just simpler because I consider uh, single propositions P instead of a whole family of propositions indexed over some type. Um, but, but it's the same apart from the fact that we are basically indexed over the unit type. 
Okay, so let's let's do a um, small quiz. Yeah, we are well in time. So let's do a small quiz. So let's say if x is a Brouwer tree ordinal, is it decidable whether x is finite? And now, well, let me remind you of what I said earlier. So everything that you would reasonably expect holds. Um, who, so, so who thinks that it's decidable whether x is finite? Okay, very good. It's uh, indeed decidable, and it's very easy because uh, zero is finite, and the successor of y is finite if y is finite, but limits are never finite. And uh, this is because I said that a limit can only be taken of some strictly increasing sequence. And if your sequence is strictly increasing, um, it has to be larger than any finite ordinal. Okay, so can we decide whether x is equal to 17? Who thinks so? Yes, uh, very good. This is also decidable. I, I think my quiz is very easy because I only allow you to vote for the correct answer. <laughs> um, <laughs> so zero is certainly not equal to 17 and limits are also not equal to 17 because we said they are infinite. And if we have a successor, we just check whether uh, this y is equal to 16. Okay, x larger 32. Now I think it probably becomes boring, but yeah, okay, this is also decidable. Um, and now is it decidable whether x is larger than omega? So now who thinks this is not decidable? <laughs> okay, very good, this is not decidable, um, <laughs> right? I mean, before in the first point, we said it's decidable whether x is finite. And being finite, or not being finite, say, corresponds to being larger or equal to omega. But now we are asking whether x is actually strictly larger than omega. And um, it's, it's easy to decide it for zero and successor. Well, at least for zero, it's easy because it's obviously not larger than omega. For successor, well, you assume that you know it for. Um, the, the, the predecessor, but now the big question is how can we decide whether the limit of the sequence x0, x1, x2, and so on is uh, strictly above omega? So let's see. So if we go through the sequence, we said that for any xi, we can check whether xi is finite. And as soon as we discover some xi that is infinite, the question is decided positively. So this sounds uh, a bit non-constructive, but actually everything I say is um, constructive. So if we find some xi that is not finite, then it follows constructively um, that the limit of the sequence is strictly larger than omega. Yeah, and, and only if all the xi's are finite, then actually uh, x is not, I mean, the limit is not strictly larger than omega. So this should correspond to what we intuitively would think is semi-decidable. And we use the same um, synthetic notion of semi-decidable that um, Yannick and Dominic and others have, have used in their work. Uh, so we use the version that Andre Bauer has suggested, uh, 2006. So P is called semi-decidable if there is some Boolean sequence S such that P holds exactly if this Boolean sequence is true somewhere. And now it's well, pretty much non-surprising that the question whether X is strictly above omega is semi-decidable because we, I mean, we just uh, discussed that you can look at the sequence and check whether every um, element of the sequence is finite or not. <coughs> Okay, but now what about the other direction? So say we are given some Boolean sequence, S. Uh, can we, well, we, well, so we want to construct an ordinal which corresponds to the sequence. And we can do this. We can first construct a sequence F by setting F0 to zero because why not? And we set Fn plus one. Well, we have to be increasing. So we either set it to fn plus one, or we set it to f of n plus omega. 
And uh, we choose the first option if n is such that the Boolean sequence is true at position n. And then you can actually show quite easily that the limit of this f is strictly larger than omega exactly if the original sequence is true somewhere. Okay, so, so now the funny thing is that this not, not only does it show, I mean, not only can we show that the question whether x is strictly larger than omega is semi-decidable, this is actually an, a new equivalent formulation of being semi-decidable. Um, sorry, do I have this? Oh, yeah. So if we have this uh, property P or this type P, then saying that P is semi-decidable in this sense that you have this uh, Boolean sequence is equivalent to asking whether there is a Y in, in this type of Brouwer trees such that Y is larger than omega exactly if P holds. So I suggested this, um, this uh, terminology that we call this one P is decidable in omega steps, even though I'm not sure anymore uh, because I'm not sure whether this really conveys the intuition correctly. But um, due to a la lack of an alternative terminology, I keep this terminology for now. Um, but, but now if we have realized this, it's a quite obvious question to ask, well, can we just replace omega up here by another ordinal? Because really omega is just, well, it happened to work so far for this semi-decidability uh, situation. But in principle, we could take any ordinal alpha and say that, well, if we have, uh, if we can prove this statement, then this means that P is decidable in alpha steps, whatever that means. Okay, so I mean, let's, um, let's see what ordinals alpha make sense here. I mean, for which ones we have um, examples. So if, if n is a natural number, then saying that p is decided in n steps is, well, it's, it's not very surprising that this means that P is decidable because we have said before that um, Y larger than N is decidable. So this here is essentially a Boolean. Um, so we can just have a look at, at this one to check whether P holds or not. And there's really nothing more to say about this finite case, it's just that um, so, so let's uh, go to the case where we want to do more than omega many steps, which I think is more interesting. So one um, example that I have here is the twin prime conjecture, which I call TPC, which says that there are arbitrarily large numbers P such that both P and P plus two are prime. And the conjecture is that, yeah, I mean, the conjecture is that there are arbitrarily a large such examples, but this conjecture is still unsolved. And um, I mean, I, I don't know anything about number theory, so this is really just some example. I mean, I don't know anything about prime numbers, but this question doesn't seem to be semi-decidable itself. I mean, clearly if, if you tell me, well, if you ask me, is there a um, twin prime pair above a million, then of course this is semi-decidable because I just check a million in one and a million in three and so on and, and like search until I find a pair of twins. But uh, the question itself seems not to be decidable. However, we can show that um, the twin prime conjecture is decidable in omega square steps, which means we can construct some Brouwer ordinal y such that y is equal to omega square exactly if the twin prime conjecture holds. And uh, this equality symbol here can also be replaced by larger than or larger equal, whatever you prefer. Okay, let me very quickly go through how to construct this ordinal. 
So we construct this ordinal by constructing a sequence again and setting zero to zero. And in step number n plus one, we check whether n and n plus two form a twin prime pair. And if so, then we increase by omega. And if not, then we increase by one. And now you can show that the limit of the sequence is equal to omega square, exactly if the twin prime conjecture holds. Uh, intuitively, this is because uh, twin prime conjecture holding means that we have been in this first case here, omega many times, which means we have increased this number by omega, omega many times, which gives us omega square. And well, if it does not hold, well, then we only do this finitely many times, so we reach some omega times n, but we don't reach omega square. Okay, maybe let me stop here. So, um, yeah, there's a sketch of a proof, but maybe I don't go through this because I'm running out of time. And instead, I thank you for your attention. Thank you. Questions? Just to clarify, I mean, you proved here that it's decidable in omega square steps, but it's not, you haven't proven that it's the minimal number of steps, right? Because and it feels no. a bit weird to talk about decidability of just a single state. I mean, yeah. yeah, I mean, uh, of course that's true. So if someone were to prove the twin okay. prime conjecture, then, then of course we would know decidable. that it's decidable. Uh, so then of course it would be decidable in zero steps. <laughs> yeah. So of course showing that omega square is the minimum number is uh, very, very difficult. So. But, but yeah, I mean, of course, I, I see what you um, want. So I mean, of course, all the time when I said P, you could also have assumed that P is some family indexed over whatever type you want. Like P is some predicate of Turing machines or something. And, and P says P of X says that X terminates or something. And, and all the definitions that we did remain the same. They are just all indexed over some base type. Yeah. Um, Um, I have a question in general about this notion of ordinal semi-decidability. So do you know if that is connected to infinite Turing machines or is there a connection maybe to even to the synthetic formulation we had of synthetic um, semi-decidability relative to some oracle? Um, I, I don't know that, but my guess is that the answer is yes. <laughs> um, In both cases? I mean, like, it, it seems like using larger ordinals means you have some more general version of Turing machine, essentially. But um, yeah, I, I would have to think about it. Yeah, your your TC, TPC function looked a bit like a function that could be computed with an omega square Turing machine, but. I'm yes, not. yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Thanks. To me, it looks like you are going, uh, you are starting to explore the arithmetic hierarchy. Uh, yeah, that could very so well that, be. A for instance, maybe it's uh, so for all the exist corresponds to omega to the square steps, and then you are no longer dependent on whether the twin prime conjecture also now not uh, yeah I mean I, I think that's that's a fair point so <coughs> indeed if you iterate exists and for alls uh, then this corresponds to adding a factor of omega or something like this yeah yeah and then it would be interesting to see whether, what, what is now the ordinal for three quantifiers and four etc yes Okay, well, thank the speaker.